trying to help you. I can talk without the microphone. Can anybody hear me? Okay. No. Okay. All right. Um, so anyhow, it's good to be here today. Uh, every time I do this talk, so like something different happens. Today, uh, I have Chris Wentz over here and her son Wade, and I, I, we ran into Wade at Wendy's today, you know, because I was eating fast food to be here fast. <laughs> so anyhow, Wade told his mother that uh, we were going to be here doing this talk, and uh, with that, Chris's dad worked for the Isley Dairy Company as a mechanic for 35 years. And so they're here today to, to hear about Isley's. Hopefully I can tell you something you don't know, okay? <laughs> All right. So today we're going to talk about Chip Chop Dam, skyscraper cones, and Klondikes. The three most popular things that Isley Dairy is known for. This uh, newspaper article appeared in the Vindicator last year, and it's from the archives, and it was dated on April 29th, 2023. In 1939, Harry Simcox, who lived at Wilson Avenue in Struthers, was killed when his car was struck by a locomotive at the b &O crossing in downtown Struthers. Everybody knows where that is, right? Injured were Joe Razor, 27, the milk truck driver, and Fred Murray, who was 15, who was riding with Razor. What's that have to do with Isley? Well, it started this whole story that I'm going to tell you because Joe Razor was my uncle. He was married to my Aunt Alice. And uh, Joe Razor went to school in Poland, and after I looked him up a little bit, he was quite an accomplished athlete at Poland. He, won some state championships in track, and uh, you know, he was pretty, pretty well-rounded guy. But his family owned a, a dairy in Poland, and Joe was delivering milk for him. So after he passed away, my Aunt Alice had to go to work because she and Joe had a little baby girl named Joellen. So she went to work at the Isley Dairy Company. She worked in the office. So with that being said, uh, she uh, lived actually right up the street from there on Dewey Avenue near the Fosterville where we all know that good frozen custard stand, right? So in 1944, she married Sam Isley Sr., who was then at that time president of Isley Dairy Company. And he adopted my cousin Joellen as his own daughter. In 1945, they also had a son who was Sam Leslie Jr. He currently lives in Manhattan in New York. He's a very successful investment person. And uh, I wish I had a little better relationship with him, although I, I, we're, we're great buddies. But uh, he's also a billionaire. So, you know, I could use some of his cash once in a while. So this is my Aunt Alice in the middle in the back with her two sisters, uh, my Aunt Edith on the left, my Aunt Gladys on the right. You may know my Aunt Gladys because she and her husband had canvas corner down on 14, uh, right outside of Unity. And my uncle was uh, involved in uh, the banks and things like that in East Palestine. My Aunt Edith, who uh, I hesitate to say she was my favorite of the three, but Anyhow, she uh, worked downtown in strauss Hershbergs in the middle of the main floor in the perfume department. And every once in a while, my mother would take us down there to go shopping for school clothes. That was once a year, by the way. And uh, anyhow, she always looked so beautiful and she always smelled good, you know. <laughs> Later on, uh, I was able to take care of her until her she passed away in my arms, so it was a great experience. My dad would have been in this picture, except for the fact he was in World War II. So he didn't make the picture. This is my Aunt Alice and my Uncle Sam on their honeymoon in Florida. When 1833, Christian Isley immigrated to the United States from Switzerland. He settled his family in a Switzer Township out in Western Ohio. 
He loved it out there because he, the landscape in that area was just what he remembered from his native country. Christian was a dairyman and a cheese baker in his native country, and so he brought that trade with him, and that followed through to the end of the story we're going to have today. One of the things he brought was his copper cheese making kettle, which became a family heirloom, and he handed it down to each generation. And this is where the story really begins because Christian had three sons and his son Eugene was the father of William Isley who went on to found the Isley Dairy Company. So of course the other two brothers eventually all became involved in some facet of the business but nevertheless uh, everybody, in the, everybody in the family was into dairy. There's a picture of the cheese making kettle. I couldn't buy it, so I had to print the picture for you, and I couldn't have gotten that out of the car anyhow. So, but uh, this is a family heirloom. My cousin tells me it's still in the family, uh, and somebody uh, has a prized family possession. I, I started the story. I should have told you that this is really could be a, not just the story of the Isley Dairy Company, but it could be the story of a father and his four sons. And you'll see that evolve as we talk about the rest of the story. The son William, who was the founder of the Isley Dairy Company, at the time he was 20 years old, he operated the family farm. And he also managed the cheese factory. William and his wife Louisa, who they called Ludy from the old Swiss background, had six children. They had two girls, four sons, and the sons are the ones we know and talk about today, and their names were Henry, Samuel, Charles, and Chester. All of them later became involved in the Isley Dairy business. In 1892, William moved his family to Mansfield, and he sold unpasteurized milk to, uh, from his local dairy farm to local customers, uh, mostly restaurants and hotels. In 1902, he bought the Mansfield Pure Milk Company and delivered delivery routes, 26 delivery routes. In 1904, his business went public. He sold 100 shares at a $100 share, it would be the equivalent of $300,000 today. In 1905, they changed the family name from I-S-E-L-I -E to I-S-A-L-Y. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. At that time, one of the cousins, Jesse, another son of one of the other brothers, um, joined the company. Also, I told you he had two daughters, and later on, as uh, the story evolves, both of the daughters were involved in the company, not so much as the brothers were, but the daughters and her husbands both owned the Isley Dairy stores and operated them in different parts. 1909, uh, William bought the Lucille Bread and Milk Company. He opened a first store selling dairy products and ice cream. It was at this point that uh, Isley's gained great fame for their ice cream cones, uh, and they were double the size of all the competitors. The philosophy of the company, that later became the philosophy of the company, was sell more cones at the same price as the competition and make money on the volume trade. Commercial freezers were just starting to come into use at that time. So before we had refrigerators in our kitchens, commercial freezers were the first thing where they could produce ice cream and keep it stored. In 1914, they, per they bought the Marion Milk Company, and William incorporated the business at this point and became the president. It was incorporated as the Isley Dairy Company and William's son Charles became the treasurer. Charles was the oldest son at the time, and uh, he became the treasurer. Now, we're out in Western Ohio here, okay? Nothing has happened here in our area. Nothing's happened with the company uh, that we know. But in 1914, this is where it all started. In 1918, they, produced, they purchased the Farmer's Milk Co-op and the property that's located at 1033 Mahoning Avenue in Youngstown. This location then became the main headquarters 
for the business. That's the business, the building we know, the iconic building downtown. It all, it all started down there. However, it was an empty property, and the farmers from the local area brought their milk there to be distributed to the various end users. So, it was at that property that the first building was built from scratch that the company owned. <coughs> William's son, Chester, uh, was the manager and treasurer of the company in Youngstown. His wife, Nell, had, he and his wife, Nell, had two daughters. They were Margaret and Helen. I never was able to meet Helen, but I did meet Margaret. And uh, she and I were, were uh, great friends reminiscing about the Osley Dairy Company. It was said that Chester held the position with the company but Nell held the purse strings. That sounds familiar to anyone. <laughs> this, began a, this began a great error that later haunted the Isley Dairy Company because each time William purchased a new property and started a new area, they had a new corporate structure. They never kept the original corporate structure that they started with back in Marion when they when they uh, started the business. So in 1920, this is when the Isley Dairy name took on a little bit of a cutie flavor, and that's the name, and the initials in the name stand for, I shall always love you. And that was one of the things that was spoken by a lot of the employees who uh, worked for the Isley Dairy Company over the years. So. That's when it started, back in 1920. In 1921, uh, there were 40 employees working in the Youngstown plant. They had six trucks, 10 milk wagons, and they serviced the customer base in the Youngstown area. It was at that time that they built a new garage and a gas station, actually. And uh, there's a picture of that. I hadn't gotten the picture to incorporate it into my talk yet, but uh, that was at the time when Cars were starting too, Don, right? Remember that, Don, when we started getting cars like you? <laughs> okay. <laughs> At that time in 1921, the Mansfield plant was booming, and my Uncle Sam became the treasurer. Uh, in 1918, uh, William wanted to begin retail sales to sell products. And so prior to this time, the dairy products were only sold on, on route sales. So. What came on the milk truck is what Isley sold at that time. But uh, in 1918, uh, he began franchising retail stores. And that, that, of course, from Mahoning Avenue would have been the Youngstown area. The first store was opened on Central Square in 1918. Did anybody ever go to Isley's to get a banana split before you went to the movies right next door on Central Square? Well, you guys are a lot younger than me, I can tell you right now. Oh, you remember, honey? I remember, but not in 1918. By 1924, there were 25 stores in the Youngstown area. Now, keep in mind, these are franchise stores, okay? And other people own the business, and they franchise and get their dairy products from Isley Dairy. In 1921, the first company-owned store was opened in Mansfield, Ohio. I know none of you remember the, the, the left-hand delivery method, but a lot of you remember the iconic Isley Dairy trucks, right? And uh, one of those trucks restored, Dick, is probably worth, you know, 100000 something. Okay, one of the things we never seem to remember about Isley Dairy is, you remember how they started out? William ran the family farm, right? He made cheese. Well, they never quit doing that. They always had to have farms that they could control to supply the products for the company. So they not only were making all these things at the store, they were also farming and milking cows, okay? One of the pride of the dairy, the Isley family was their dairy. Uh, so they had dairies in Mansfield, Marion, and North Jackson. 
as well as plants across the country, ended up, they were in 11 states. These other companies made cheese, butter, and other dairy products for sale in the retail store. Okay, the dairy plants uh, needed milk products, and so they, they shipped them from all over. But one I want to talk about is the 250-acre Isley Farm that was in North Jackson on Route 18, and uh, it was state-of-the-art. They experimented with milk, how they could make defatted milk, and how they could do all these things with milk. One of the things that my Uncle Sam focused on was baby milk. He wanted to have pure milk for babies. But, uh, you know, this is when some of these brown bottles came in, defatted milk. What do we call defatted milk today? You, know? yeah. you try to sell defatted milk in the store today, you go, ooh. <laughs> so nevertheless, the, the uh, farm in North Jackson, I have a picture of it right here. Uh, there's an industrial park on the 250 acres now, but that was the farm. See right on top, it's a a uh, pencil drawing of the, of the farm. Mm -hmm. And of course, they raised all from the states at that time. Byron, where's yeah. that picture taken? Is that in Switzerland? That's Switch. Switch That's yeah. what it looks like. It's yeah. So those are in the Holsteins, by the way. I know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> okay, 1921. Um, one of the things I want to talk about right now is this. There were two things going on. The mills were booming in Youngstown, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, down the whole valley. The steel mills were booming, okay? Everybody had money. And then the Great Depression hit, and nobody had a job, okay? And so we're gonna blend those into the story here. But uh, nevertheless, uh, this is what was starting to happen. In 1921. So Isley's earnings were up. They were gaining market share by systematizing their product distribution, both to their stores and their home sales. William Isley didn't get to see anything else happen because in 1923, uh, he didn't get to see the company grow. He passed away in that year. My Uncle Sam, at the age of 24 years old, became the president of Mansfield, Marion, and Youngstown. Isley Dairy. Chester continued managing the Youngstown plant and Charles was in Marion. Now, by now there were 40 stores in the company, both franchise and uh, both franchise stores and company stores. At this time, refrigeration, homogenization, and pasteurization were becoming norm of milk and dairy production. Many people still did not own <coughs> refrigerators, and ice was still used in most homes. Did anybody want to admit there was an ice box at your house? <laughs> well, my grandma had an ice box, and uh, when I went there on vacations in the summer, the ice man would come down the street. He had a horse, and he had ice that they cut out of the Ohio River. And he had it covered with a big tarp. And he would come out there, and as time went along, the ice blocks froze together, and he'd had an ice pick. That's why we save ice picks, because they're historical, okay? And uh, if you were really a good little kid, and you stood behind the ice wagon for a while, he would give you a couple of chips of ice. It was just as good as a cotton an ice cream cone at that time. So anyhow, that was when the ice man would take the ice off the wagon and bring it into your house and stick it in your refrigerator. Yeah. Okay, it wasn't a refrigerator, it was an ice box. Okay, and then every two or three days he'd show up again because the ice would melt, of course, and keep your food cold. But in 1920, there were 20,000 home refrigerators in the United States. By 1930, there were 850, each of them costing a little bit below $100. In 1929, Isley's expanded into the Pittsburgh market. The youngest son, Henry, became manager and treasurer. Here we go again, they changed the corporate structure in Pittsburgh, and uh, Charles was the president. Sam 
was the secretary and the vice president was John Marty, who was Isley's biggest stockholder and a big dairy farmer. Does everybody know the Marty farms out in western county, part of the county? I didn't know. Well, that's a tie with Isley Dairy, okay? Okay, so John Marty was uh, highly involved in the, or deeply involved with the Isley company and the Isley family. We're gonna notice a trend starting here because from this point on, the family was plagued by a heart disease problem that was ran throughout the whole entire family, okay? It says here that Chester began to have heart problems and he had a nervous disorder as well. Remember, he's the guy that runs the Youngstown plant at this point. One of the things that when, they when Henry started the Pittsburgh plant, Chester got all nervous about it because he thought the company was expanding too quickly and they were getting out of control. But keep in mind, the same market that we had in Youngstown was the market they had in Pittsburgh because of the steel workers and those checks they got every Friday, okay? So, so he began to have heart problems and he returned home from his vacation in Florida in 1931. And at the age of 31, because of all the things going on in his life, he took his own life at the downtown Youngstown plant in the restroom. And he left his wife, Nell, and their two daughters. Well, let me a little note here, some of you might know this, but the Isley Dairy Company built a new home for Nell and her two daughters uh, in Poland, Ohio. It's right beside the Presbyterian Church. And eventually the Presbyterian Church bought that home and it's incorporated into the church building now. But that home was built for now and her two daughters. There's a picture of the house. Okay, so it was, during this time, the Great Depression was getting into full swing. Many people were looking for work, and at the same time, Isley's was expanding, and the company was growing <coughs> immensely. So Isley's had to sell their dairy products, and their store expansion was continuing to wrap up, ramp up. Many people found a job in these stores. They couldn't find work anywhere else. That's where I shall always love you became a slogan for ex-employees and people who work there. And they were very grateful for the opportunity. Most of them became loyal, lifetime employees. Many of these people had shared their glowing testimonies over the years of working for Isley's, and the pay was 25 cents an hour. In 1931, the Boulevard plant opened in Pittsburgh. They opened a retail store on the first floor, and their dairy production was on the other floors, and they sold ice cream and dairy products from the main floor uh, store. It was much like the main floor store in the downtown plant, where, uh, you know, if you remember Isley's, at some point, somebody took you downtown to the big building and got you an ice cream cone, okay? And so with that being said, in Pittsburgh, because of their popularity, and it, it, their store took off by storm in Pittsburgh, they made 12,000 skyscraper ice cream cones in one day, wow. served by 30 scoopers. <laughs> so, each one of those four ounces of ice cream cost five cents. <laughs> also in 1931, uh, and by the way, I, I wanna go back to Henry a little bit. Can, Henry was a college graduate when he became president of the store in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, okay? <clears throat> That's gonna be important later, but anyhow, he was, right out of college. So he was somewhere between 20 and 20, 22 and 24 years old. So after his opening success in Pittsburgh, uh, President Sam Isley made a survey of all the stores in the chain. Remember by now we had company stores, we had franchise stores. And what he found was that the franchisees were not keeping up with the standard of cleanliness, product and service. So it was at this point that the redesign of the Isley store was remodeled. All the stores in the company, including the franchise stores, were remodeled, standards were set, and even though the Depression was in full swing, 
Obviously, for reporting to increase sales and profits. Some of the iconic things we remember, those the signs on the front of buildings and, and the lettering, the little blue lettering in there, today you can't even buy the stuff that was made out of it. Their signs were all porcelain, and uh, you don't see the quality that was there. I told you my uncle was a stickler about the dairy in North Jackson. He was more so about the stores and the company and he did something about it. Here's a picture of an uh, iconic Isley Dairy store. Uh, some of the stores were large. You might remember one in Columbia, it was a big store. And the one in North Lima was a little store. Did, did Springfield Township have an Isley? Yep, yeah. in Middletown. In Middletown. In Middletown, okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Did, did you work there, Dick? No. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so the slogan there ends the quest for the best. So here were some of the prices back in those days. Uh, you could buy a boiled ham sandwich for 10 cents. You could, this is a good one. I wish I hadn't taken advantage of this. But anyhow, you could buy a hot meat sandwich with mashed potatoes and gravy for 20 cents. <laughs> Tom, I told you your prices were too high. <laughs> baked beans for a nickel, potato salad for a dime, uh, you know, a dozen eggs over there, 49 cents. Uh, chip pressed ham, 89 cents a pound. So uh, those were some of the prices. <coughs> 1933 to 1935, uh, during the Depression, employment at the Isley Dairy Company tripled in size. They also opened new plants in Akron and Canton. Pittsburgh plant was supplying 60 Isley stores for their location in Pittsburgh. And much of the success and philosophy of the company was to locate stores in communities where workers were raising families with their base from the steel mill in both Youngstown and Pittsburgh. I mean, who can't remember your dad taking you there for an ice cream cone? Okay. During this time, each branch had a quality control person, and back to my Uncle Sam making a survey of the stores, uh, and they visited each store in the jurisdiction so as to serve and maintain uniform quality and cleanliness throughout the company. Service was paramount to the success of each store, and bonuses were given to the managers uh, for increased sales and high scores in store performance and cleanliness. And the bonus was two silver dollars. Okay. I had a lady tell me that she still had her dad's silver dollars that he got. So. Isley's continued to use glass bottles and containers for all their products, and they came in all sizes and shapes. They never went to paper cartons until the late 1940s. And I have, you know, I have a bunch of bottles up here. Uh, my friend Lenny bought me a couple of bottles in today. And, uh, this is how you got your milk. If you had a big family, you got your milk in this carrier. And, uh, you know, we have the iconic little bottle here. Who's yours? Whose is this? Oh, that's yours. Okay, thank you for bringing that. <laughs> but uh, here's, here's some of the old Isley bottle with the big top. And this, of course, would have a paper closer in them. Here's one for uh, cream. You know, if you um, if your mom was going to have Jello that night, she'd tell the milkman, "Make sure you bring me a bottle of cream." You know, and you, you had your order that you put out so that the milkman knew what you wanted. And uh, so that, that. By the way, does anybody remember uh, the milkman bringing the milk into the house? Of course. Yeah. There's there's a little. There's a little lot uh, we won't talk about that. Anyhow. 1938, Isley Stores uh, began another expansion and improvement project under the guidance of uh, Uncle Sam and local architect Schumacher and Osley. Uh, Osley had studied architecture in Europe, and he came back to work in his family uh, business in downtown Youngstown. And that's how I came up with this Art Deco style for the building that we all know about. 
at 1033 Mahoning Avenue. Uh, so the uh, whole expansion and improvement project was completed. All existing stores were again remodeled and standardized. Uh, and the front facades were all the same. By 1947, there were 450 company stores and 200 franchisees. There were 11 plants in six states that serviced all the retail outlets. So there was a lot of dairy products being shipped around. They, they came from Wisconsin and, and some far away states even to service the area. So 1942, the second of the four Isley brothers died, died at a young age and passed away from a heart attack. So in part now, the company was being run by some third generation uh, members of the Isley family and also some outside employees who had gained uh, favor with the family and had moved up through the ranks as employees. So there's the design you would have seen when Osley designed the downtown building. You can see the Isley name up there on the tower. Uh, my Uncle Sam's office was right up at the top. He had it decorated with uh, saltwater fish, swordfish, and marlins, and all those kinds of things. And I only think I ever was in his office maybe twice, but uh, it left an indelible impression on my, my memory. So, uh, and then of course, this is what the ugly part of it looks like, and uh, that's the one we most closely associate with at this point. This is a Pittsburgh plant. This is a very beautiful building. And uh, it, was, uh, it was the one that Henry operated from. And downtown, down in the bottom, of course, was that retail store that we talked about where they served the ice cream cones. Anybody know where that picture taken? South you, Avenue. You can't see it. You can't see No, it wasn't South Avenue. But that was a good guess, Lenny. Marketing. There's, there's one clue here, and you're not going to see it on the TV. But... Uh, Right over here, it says Daniel E. Smith, Jewelers. Salem, Salem Ohio. Right. So that's the Salem Ohio Dairy Store. That's the iconic fronts that they had during that time. Of course, that era there, that's somewhere around uh, 1962 or something. Is that a 62 Ford Dairy Yeah, it's the Mustang. Yeah, the Mustang. 65 Mustang. Yeah, right. Okay, in 1946, uh, Sam Osley, a third of William and Louie's sons, passed away at the age of 47 with a heart attack. He was vacationing in Arizona with my aunt, and uh, he, again, my aunt became a widow, uh, left by her, her husband and the third member of the Osley family, brothers, to die. And the operation of the company then fell on the shoulders of uh, the brother Henry, and here is where the Isley Dairy Company started to decline. You have to remember, Henry was a young kid when he opened the Isley plant in Pittsburgh. If you know all the big families in Pittsburgh, Henry hobnobbed with every one of them and golfed with every one of them. His interest was far from Youngstown Live. However, the corporate headquarters was in Youngstown. And so because of that, uh, the, the company and what happened here in Youngstown was kind of left to drift along. Uh, a fellow who was a cousin of the brothers, Walter Paulo, became the head of the Youngstown operation. And any of you remember Walter Paulo? He was also a politician. And now, Chris, we're getting to the point where your dad started working for the company. Yeah, about there, a little bit, yeah. We're a little more. Okay. Yeah. So, another thing happened in 1946, and this is really uh, sticks in my mind because I, I kind of got, I kind of remember all the talk about it with my parents and my aunt and everybody. Uh, but the company in 1946 started to become organized by union. First, the retail clerk union, and later the drivers were all organized by the Teamsters. And so, in 1947, after the war was over, and all the guys were coming back from the war, uh, the country was moving to suburbia. That's when we got the 
big housing development behind the Boardman Plaza and other places, and uh, shopping plazas became popular. So before that, remember, we're living in town here, and we're working in the mill, and we're going to Isley for everything, because it was one of the only places to go, other than the grocery. So Isley's, of course, was a highly sought, at, sought after tenant, because they paid their bills, and they were a very good uh, company, and uh, they had local recognition. And so for these plazas opening up, the first stores they wanted to be at were Isley Dairy. And you can all remember Risley's being right on the corner of some of the plazas, if you can remember. Okay, uh, the Isley labor force still was increasing, and the franchises were increasing as well. Some of the guys coming back from the war bought stores, started opening their own businesses. This later became the, this would be the look of the suburban Isley stores. Uh, and you can see this one was a recent one because we, we already have handicapped sidewalks here, you know. That was because this was one of the last stores in the company. 1947 to 1961, after the death of Sam, uh, the surviving brother, Henry, took over the operation of the company. The emphasis shifted from Youngstown to Pittsburgh, where Henry had been since he graduated from college, and his home base and his contacts were in Pittsburgh. During this time, the company started to begin, began to lose market share in some of their areas. Columbus became a losing proposition. Remember, we're in Marion and Mansfield, and they expanded down into the Columbus area. That, that shrunk back to Marion and Mansfield area. Uh, and later, uh, Marion took over all of that area. So uh, this, is, this is when everything started to, uh, to disintegrate, really. So some of the rules that you had to adhere to if you were an employee at Isley Dairy. First of all, you're not allowed to fraternize with any of the other employees. That means girls and guys weren't allowed to date. Okay. So, with that being said, it was literally dismissal if you got caught. And, uh, you know, if you read some of the other, there, there are many books about Osley's, but uh, they, have, they have a story about a couple that worked at the Struthers store, and they secretly dated for a year, and then they got caught. And then they lost their job. But they weren't bad because they knew that they had broken one of the company rules, and they loved working for Osley's. No people of color were allowed to serve customers during any of this time that we talked about. However, many of the larger stores, including the big store downtown and not some of the others, they had porters of, uh, of color that would clean tables and keep the store clean. Uh, any of them were free to eat and be served in the stores, however. There was no objection to that. Women were not put into management positions until 1966. All these rules were only applied to the company stores and the franchisees were a little bit more loose with regard to that. So Osley's gradually cut milk production from their own dairies. They relied on local uh, co-ops to supply their milk. The result of that were milk strikes from time to time, bad publicity with the public, who were at that time union workers and who they derived their pay uh, from the Union Steel Mills and other trades. So with that being said, I, I don't know if any of you remember the milk being dumped in the gutters downtown on Mahoney Avenue. Or, you know, they did that as well. So here we go, 1961. Henry Isley, the only surviving brother, he was on his way home from a Pirates baseball game. He suffered a heart attack while driving through Pittsburgh, hit a parked car. And so at age 56, the last of the four Isley brothers and the family le legacy passes on to the next generation. Henry's son, H. William Isley, became the leader in face of the Isley Dairy Company. And at that time, Isley's was considered the largest dairy chain in the United States, so, 1961. Though again, facing fierce competition from fast food chains and other dairy companies, this is when the time Lawson's came in and all those other dairy stores that we recognize the names, uh, the, uh, without the, firm, the personal touch of the four brothers, Isley Dairy gradually lost market share and began to sell off their assets. 
It was about this time that a guy named Ray Kroc, anybody recognize that name, Ray Kroc? He showed up at the Isley board meeting, and he knew the Isley Dairy Company was struggling, and so he proposed to Isley that Isley's and McDonald's merge. And if they had done that, who knows what would have happened. But the board voted, and by one vote, they decided not to join with Ray Kroc. True story. 1977, the main plant in Youngstown was sold to the U-Haul for a warehouse. Some of the equipment that was there moved to Pittsburgh, but uh, most of it was auctioned. All the milk production moved to Pittsburgh. Cheese and butter plants are still operated. Uh, and some of these cheese and butter plants that they had literally started up to supply only Isley Dairy, but they eventually had to move off and sell to other customers. And as a result of that, uh, they didn't give Isley Dairy the quality products that they had in their dairy standards. So, uh, again, uh, they operated the, the uh, remaining stores, uh, but they began to decline as the market begins to shift its demands. We're in suburbia, you know, we don't have steel mills anymore. You know, everything's changing here. 1960 to 1990, Isley tried to rebrand itself, started several eateries with new menus and new concepts. They were never able to succeed in many of the markets though. And uh, because of that, because of the mills closing down, uh, some of the last stores were holdout franchisees who refused to give up, but they were no longer able to find and sell the quality, quality products that Isley uh, was noted for and that they were used to selling. Um, just a little side note here, uh, Bill Isley uh, came to Youngstown, I said he took over the business from Henry in Pittsburgh, he came to Youngstown and he opened a store, the first one was called the Isley Shop and he built it up by the university, in fact it was right across the street from the main building, there's still a little plaza there and he built the Isley Shop and uh, you know, you saw the prices on the price list earlier, well, you know, instead of a banana split costing $1.50 at the Dairy Queen, who was a competitor, uh, they sold big banana splits for $5. And of course, they're across the street from the university where they have students that are barely making their tuition and <laughs> that never succeeded. But uh, I fortunately got to work at that store when they were building it, and uh, Bill, and I, Bill Osley and I uh, got to be good friends during that time. Now, my aunt is still living at this time as well. Keep that in mind, okay? My aunt is still living. So what exactly is Chip Chop Ham? Well, Chip Chop Ham actually started by accident, okay? Remember in the menu, they were selling Chip Ham? They didn't call it Chip Chop Ham, they called it Chip Ham. It was selling for uh, 89 cents a pound. And uh, wasn't going too good. So the story goes that one of the managers at one of the stores said, I don't know what I'm going to do with this, but he sent his slicer all the way to zero. Mm -hmm. And he started running his hand through the slicer. Okay? Almost immediately, Chip Chop Ham took off in his store. Any of you remember him putting barbecue sauce on it too? Okay. Oh, yeah. Isley barbecue sauce became popular because of that. Eventually, Chip Chop Ham became so popular that Isley's had somebody make them the chippers, the slicers, just for Isley's Chip Chop Ham. Okay? So, with that being said, uh, what's Chip Chop Ham made out of actually? Anyhow, why is it so good? Uh, it's actually fat meat, and muscle that are the trimmings from shaping a ham into a ham, that familiar football shape that we recognize. <clears throat> the trimmings are all collected, they're seasoned, they're shaped in a square tin, they're lined with butcher paper, and they're cooked for five and a half hours and made into a meatloaf. Mm -hmm. The resultant meat contains only 8% fat. <coughs> 
So the loaf is now ready to sell, and when spliced, sliced by a specially designed splicer that was exclusive to Isley's, it becomes Isley's chip chop ham. Now, why do we want to talk about chip chop ham? Because it was one of the last products that you could get with the Isley Neen one, okay? Even after all the stores were closed, supposedly you could buy chip chop ham. <coughs> Anybody have a glass of water? <laughs> okay. Well, there's lots of uh, conjecture about chip chop ham and how it started, but eventually chip chop ham actually outsold ice cream at Isley Dairy, as far as dollar volume. So here's, here's the favorite picture. You see it's 59 cents a pound, <laughs> often imitated but never equal. Oh, thank you. Nurse to the rescue. <laughs> okay, skyscraper ice cream cone. Skyscraper cones were made as early as the teens by Flounder William. Remember, back in Mansfield, he opened the first dairy store, and he made these with the regular spoon. But somehow, he developed the skyscraper shape at that time. In 1935, my Uncle Sam had somebody in Maysbury, Ohio, who was a machinist of some sort, make the original skyscraper scoops, okay? They delivered it to the store, and my Uncle Sam was very happy about it. And of course, he started to put them out into the stores for use. But uh, the guy that made them also decided his friends might like to have a few of them too. So with that being said, uh, my uncle discovered that he wasn't the only one that had skyscraper scoops. And he went back to measure to the guy. He demanded that he bring all the scoops back that he had pawned off on some of his friends, and he demanded that he, the Isley Dairy Company owned the patents. So, scoops were provided to all the stores, thousands of scoops of ice cream were made each day. All of them still weighed four ounces, and they were still twice the size of the competition, and they sold for a nickel in 1935. Took special training to make the correct twist of the wrist to get the right size scoop. And if you didn't get the twist of the wrist right, you might not have a job. It was paramount that you knew how to make a skyscraper cone. So one of the reasons a scoop was a scoop was because the mechanical ones would break as easily. If we're making, you know, if we're making twelve thousand ice cream cones in a day, you can imagine how sore your thumb would get if you, you know, used one of these guys. And then of course the gears will wear out and break and. And uh, who knows where you'd, you'd be out of business because the scoop broke. So, Osley's had as many as 40 flavors. The flavors were kept in the own specially designed cabinets, and the ice cream was kept only in metal cans. Okay? If you look at an ice cream cabinet today, paper cartons, right? My uncle insisted, and this did the other brothers, glass bottles. Metal cans for the ice cream. One of the other things that's a story about Osley's is that when you got a job there, they gave you a can of ice cream, and you went down in the basement and you <coughs> practiced, yeah. but you didn't lose the ice cream down the green. You had to take it from one can into the empty can next door. Yeah. And then that's how you learned how to use the scoop and became a scooper. Okay, again, Isley sold uh, as many as 12,000 cones in a day. And uh, today, a single scoop as a keepsake or memento could cost as much as $1,000 on the internet, okay? I have access to two of them. I wasn't able to get them today because I couldn't hook up with the guys that I know that own them. But uh, they are indeed prized possessions. So there's a guy who learned how to make them, and uh, he looks pretty happy there. And you can see the scoop in his left, in his right hand there. Uh, but it, it looked nothing different than just a 
like a little clamshell thing. But look at the cones on the rack in anticipation of the ice cream. Okay, the last surviving product from Osley Dairy was a Klondike bar. Okay? Uh, I can't remember what the company was, but I think it was just Eskimo Pie. But they made Eskimo Pies. And uh, with that being said, all the other dairy companies rushed to find an answer to the Eskimo Pie. And the answer for Osley's was the Klondike bar. Uh, the only difference was Osley's had that high quality ice cream and because they were Swiss farmers, they had Swiss chocolate that they dipped the things in. Well, they didn't dip them, but they, they, got, they got on there anyway. Anyhow, uh, Klondike's again, they were made in various flavors of ice cream. Some of them had dipped in nuts. Uh, the Klondike, Klondike's made in the Youngstown plant had a stick. One's made in Pittsburgh, didn't have a stick, okay? Anybody know what's on the stick? What was on the stick? On some of them. On some of them. Three cones. Three. Yeah. yeah. So. Now the cones, some of them had a, like, like this, and they had two. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's if we're really hungry. Yeah. Trish is remembering the cone with two places to put the ice cream, okay? All right, so, but nevertheless, back to the Klondike. Uh, they had that three on the stick. <clears throat> Another little story was that when the truck brought the Klondikes to the store for sale, the clerks would go through them, and they'd find your free ones. <laughs> and then when the girlfriend came in after school for a Klondike, she always got a free uh. Klondike. <laughs> you may have been one of those girlfriends. Okay, the Isley, rest of the Isley plants made Klondikes without stick, and that's what the ones we remember today. They're wrapped in foil, and uh, they became a company standard, and they still were, up until a few years ago, uh, the one that carried the Isley name to the end, okay? At the end of the story, Isley sold their name, okay? They didn't sell any more franchise, they sold their name, and several companies bought their name, and of course, as things go along on the world market, the people that own the last Isley name now are the largest food distributor in the world, okay? But they no longer use the name. They just bought it to avoid the comp eliminate the competition. <clears throat> the other thing that happened with Klondike's is when they started making them by the second owner of the, of the, owner of the product, they didn't no longer use the Swiss chocolate and the quality ice cream. And that's one of the things the franchisees ran into was that uh, they, they, they couldn't compete with the, mark, with the other dairy products because they lost their quality. And that was the end of Isley's, okay? Because people had a standard that they recognized from way back when. Uh, okay. Oh, the other day, I, I, did, this, I did this story at uh, the YMCA, and uh, so the lady says, I have a surprise for you when the program's over. I said, oh, okay, here. So sure enough, she comes out with six pints of ice cream. They said, Isley's on, okay? And so we all had a snack. So that's what we're expecting here today. <laughs> Okay. Do you, do you remember the pickle barrel in yeah. Johnstown? Oh, yeah. The yeah. 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 yeah pickle. In the pickle, pickle barrel or pickle jar. Okay. Uh, so, so anyhow, with the Klondikes, with the Klondikes, uh, that, was, that was the last product. The guy that actually, it's the last Isley that owned the Klondike product moved it to Florida. Okay, and that's where that's where met his demise. But uh, you know, you should have kept it in the north where it's cold. Right? Okay. So there's the Klondikes, and there's uh, there's what they last look like in their foil wrappers. 
Who remembers the iconic polar bear there, huh? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> All right, so some of the things you might remember from Isley's is, uh, how many of you remember going on the tour of the Isley Dairy Plant downtown? Oh, yeah. Okay, the school bus take you down here? Yes, sir. And where else did you go? You went to the Ward Baking Company across the street. You I only remember Isley's. <laughs> okay, well, you couldn't forget it because you got the free treat, right? <laughs> okay, so you went to the Ward Baking Company, watched them bake bread. Right across the street was the Isley plant. And, uh, you know, you went across there, went up to the fifth floor, and somebody from Isley's uh, was a, you know, a representative would meet you over there and tell you all about the dairy company and all that. And then they'd give you some kind of an ice cream treat. Everybody remembers the dairy chalet at the Cave Phil Fair, right? Mm -hmm. so that's, that's one of the places that we remember Isley's. Anybody remember here Marjorie Mariner? Yeah. Uh, she, she had a radio program from the Isley store, yeah. I mean from the Isley plant downtown. You remember that? Yeah. yeah. You got good recipes from her, yeah. didn't you? Yeah. Anyway, uh -huh. Okay. So, who does remember the milkman come and put milk in your fridge? Milk. Well, we all lived in the country, so didn't we? we had our, yeah, we got it from the milk house, right? Yeah. By the way, the other day I said, I said to the group, I said, uh, how many, how many of you are, how many of you know a farmer? Out of the whole group of 120 people put up their hands. How many of you know a farmer today? See, we live in the country, right? Some of us are farmers. But when I asked this group, 20 out of 100. And some of them went like this. <laughs> okay, but anyhow, the milkman used to come put milk in your refrigerator for you. <laughs> so do you, 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 all, you all know the little joke about the milk? Your brother looks like the milk. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, all right, getting nice skip from the ice wagon, we were talking about that. Whoa. Whoa. Okay, stay with us. Okay, well, here's what I remember about Isley. I remember Edie. Edie, yeah. She was the face of the Isley Dairy Store in North Lima. And people went there. They went to Isley's not to get ice cream. They went to see Edie. Okay. And I, I've had a lot of guys admit that to me. So anyhow, Edie was, uh, she epitomized an Isley employee because she was efficient, always neatly dressed, pretty brunette hair, and she was friendly to everybody. She had later opened up the Tiger Stable. You remember that? Okay. Uh, the Osley store was at the end of my paper route. You got a picture of her? Holy smokers. Was she your cousin or anything? <laughs> you can bring her over. No, I don't want to get on camera. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> okay, so anyhow, the Osley store was at the end of my paper route, and uh, they had the best place for grilled cheese sandwiches and chili. All right, and that's where I learned to put tomatoes on my grilled cheese sandwich at the Osley store. <laughs> so my mom could never understand why I wasn't hungry when I came home for dinner after I delivered my paper. You know? Here's another thing I remember. I also remember my Uncle Sam because uh, my dad got out of the Army uh, and he had jacked the car up and put it on blocks while he was in the Army. You remember my dad, don't you? Yeah. Anyhow. Mm -hmm. don't you? Close. Anyhow. <laughs> Anyhow. He jacked the car up and put it on blocks. And he put a canvas tarp on the top of it. And during the time he was in the Army, the canvas top, the canvas cover rotted, 
and the canvas cover on the car rotted. That's how old the car was. It had a, one of the canvas insulin. And um, so my dad got the car off the blocks. And it was my cousin's sixth birthday party in Boardman on Newport Drive. Anybody know where Newport Drive? Well, at the time, Newport Drive in 1947 or whatever. It was a pretty nice place. You know? My dad decided to drive that old car up there. And I was in the back seat, and we didn't have a roof. And it wasn't a convertible. <laughs> <laughs> and I was so embarrassed when we pulled in the driveway. Now, how do you remember things like that? I have no idea. <laughs> Anyhow, we went to my cousin's sixth birthday party, and my Uncle Sam had made special molds. He had special molds made. Remember, he had ice cream scoops made, he had freezers made, he, had, he was used to making stuff to make stuff. So he made Disney figurine molds for ice cream for my cousin's sixth birthday. Now he had just adopted my cousin as his daughter, so he wanted to make her happy. And so I remember eating those Disney molds, ice cream, at my cousin's birthday party. Also, it was the first time I ever had a maid answer the door and say, <coughs> Can I ask who's calling? <laughs> and so anyhow, that was one of the things that my uncle did. Well, that's the end of the story. Uh, there's Uncle Sam and my Aunt Alice, who saw a picture of her before. That just confirms that they, they were together and Uncle Sam was my uncle. I don't remember too much about him because they were only married for a couple of years before he passed away. But nevertheless, uh, they had an enjoyable life. I told you that Chester's wife now got a hospital for her. The Isley Dairy Company took care of my aunt and her children very comfortably uh, during their time. My cousin at 15, Sam Jr., was wrestling at prep school and he was flipped over and he broke his neck and from that point on, he's lived his life as a quadriplegic. But he's been a Rhodes Scholar, and he's succeeded in life, and I told you he's made himself a billionaire by an international investment fund. Wow. At one time, Sam was so adamant and, and had such great feelings for the Isley Dairy Company that just like Ray Kroc, he went to the board and made him an offer to buy the dairy company from, from the uh, family and uh, they refused. So who knows what would happen, but uh, nevertheless, uh, that's my Osley story, and I'm going to stick to it. <laughs> Chris, I want you to share something about your dad working. Well, I was Stand. never without ice cream. Yes. <laughs> yeah. My dad, the, uh, the shop for the dairy was just behind the old Isley building, it was down behind it. And uh, my mom would take, my sister and I, after we would be shopping downtown, we would stop there and my dad, that's when they had uh, the ice cream, not the ice cream, the milk and the cartons. Oh, yeah. And we would go over with the, the free, or the refrigeration units that would slide this way. And dad would say, you know, take milk, whatever you want. And they had a, a thing that had a little ice creams in it, a little, you know, the little, they used to come in the little, I can remember little cubes of ice cream. Yeah. We would have yeah, that. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. And then my dad also at the fair, he would do, um, they sent him to refrigeration school. So if there was any refrigeration problems on any of the freezers, like we would get into the fair, dad would say, hey, I'm going to the chalet to, boy, we'd hop in the truck and away we'd go. And yeah, so I had, and you were talking about the $7. Yeah. I have my dad's. There you go. I've got my dad's. Um, they got him a watch for 30 years. Yes. Yep, and it's engraved on the back from the Isley Company. I have that. I've got signs. Isley signs. You were talking about the porcelain signs. Yes. I've got a 4 by 8 that says Isley's. I've got all sorts of little ones. Yeah, 500. Got, uh, Pardon? I'll give you 500 for you. <laughs> 